At 21, 22, I thought I was so wise and I knew so much about the world. And in that moment, I, I was like, I know nothing. <laughs> you know, like I'm looking at my body and I see that it's very bloody. And I remember first just going, hmm, surgery's a little more brutal than I thought it would be. And my hip was opened up, my back was opened up. And I remember thinking, should I be losing that much blood? But then the next thing that I saw were these large light beings behind the neurosurgeons. All right, welcome to the show. My name's John and my guest today is Trisha Barker, who had a near-death experience due to a horrifying a uh, car accident and uh, thankfully she's here to talk about it thank you so much for being on the show she also has written a book by the way angels in the or i just wanted to mention that and i will also put a link down in the description hi trisha how are you hi john thanks for having me on your show i'm looking oh, forward to this me too it's an honor i'm so happy you're here so i'm going to just let you tell your story and if you can maybe let us know a little bit like who trisha barker was before the whole accident and then sort of transition into the near uh, nde is that cool yeah, definitely. Right. So awesome. I did have a fear of death before my near-death experience. Before the show, we were talking about uh, how one of our missions is to help people ah, be at ease with that transition. And I had no ease around that. In fact, I would even have panic attacks uh, just thinking sometimes about dying because I was agnostic in college. I had grown up um, in an evangelical home that was abusive. And so this anger at at religion was a part of me just turning away from anything spiritual anything religious and you know school was always my saving grace and so i got into a good university got twenty thousand dollars worth of scholarships like you know my life in east texas was focused on get out of here and get to school and become successful and to me monetary success in this world that we live in was a way to make my ego feel better about growing up poor, about being judged by how I presented myself. And that was uh, a big part, I think, of my motivation. You know, the physical world was very important to me. I was very encased in my body, but I was also dealing with a lot of emotional pain and trauma. And so I started experimenting with drugs and alcohol and not really until the end of college, though. I mean, like the first couple of years, I had this great grade point average. And then, you know, by my senior year, things were falling apart. Uh, and I remember thinking, you know, a series of events happened and I was like, OK, I am went to see a therapist and she said, what did you enjoy doing in high school? And it was running. And so I started training for the Austin 10K and was running a lot. And my time was pretty fast. And I was even, you know, under this belief system that maybe I could place or at least get, you know, like very, very um, high in the, the uh, placement of people. And so I was running every day. I was in great shape. And then on the day of the race, and I didn't put this in my book, but I think precognition is important. And I felt these dreams before my accident that were so strange. I heard my father almost like down this tunnel of time going, watch out. And then my mother would scream and just go, no, 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 I can't believe this. No. Uh, and, and I'd wake up and I'd think that was strange. And I didn't get up early often in the morning you know like all my classes were later I waited tables late into the night and so I was a night person and getting up for this race was tough and I didn't stop for coffee and all I know is that the first light was yellow it was a strange intersection and the next light was red and as I was putting on my foot on the brake I didn't understand why someone was coming so quickly at me but uh, almost as if maybe he had anticipated the light and never slowed down. We hit each other at about 60 miles an hour and not, not straight on, but pretty close to straight on. He was in a very large car and I was in a Honda Civic. And years later, I looked back at Honda Civic hatchback, you know, the, the year, um, it was an older car when I was driving it, it was like instant death at that speed. So my body was very broken. Uh, I had, my back was broken in three places. My um, ankle was broken as well, and my knees were split open, um, but not to the point where I had to have surgery on the knees. But I just remember looking down at my body and thinking, ooh, this is bad. <laughs> and I couldn't raise up to get into the glove box. Uh, I'll always think of the woman who eventually stopped. So this was a Sunday. 
and lots of people on their way to church passed us and didn't stop. And even a group of teenagers like screamed because the other car looked pretty bad. Uh, the windshield had broken and he had blood running down his face. And so it was a, a gruesome scene, but she understood this nurse that I was the one in bad shape because I was slumped over and I couldn't write myself. And she stayed with me and, you know, calmed me down and told me it was going to be a long journey that they were going to put me on a board and take me to the hospital. Well, I know you're in Canada and you guys have health insurance <laughs> for, for people in, in bad accidents. I never thought as someone raised um, very poor, I just thought, well, as soon as I get a good job and I was so close to graduation, and then automatically I'll, I'll have health insurance and not a big deal. I didn't think it would affect my treatment. I just thought, oh God, I'm going to really be in debt after today. And I went into the hospital as they were waiting for a neurosurgeon, I heard a nurse say, oh, I called Dr. So-and-so. He's not coming in. He's going to stay on the golf course because she doesn't have health insurance. And I knew she was talking about me. Like they were right behind the curtain. And I got so angry at that point. I, I just like all the rage, you know, I'd been crying all day and, you know, understanding my injuries. And at that point, I just thought, oh, I'm throwaway. I'm just this throwaway human being that people don't care about. And, you know, here I am, you know, clawing my way up in the world, trying to do my best, and I'm just going to be thrown away. And this other neurosurgeon came through and she had been on duty for 40 hours. And she looked at my chart and looked at me and then I just talked to her and I advocated for myself and said, I want you to operate on me. I understand I don't have health insurance, but I'm a student, you know, I'll do my best to pay this bill. You know, I, I really, I need this operation. And if I don't walk, I'm going to kill myself. And, you know, I just said it like that, you know, to her, because at that point, I just thought life wouldn't be worth it if I couldn't run, if I couldn't use my legs, if I couldn't, you know, be... I didn't trust my parents enough to take care of me. I didn't really have anyone in the world. It just seemed, even with this fear of death, it just seemed like this would be too much for me. So she heard me and she took me into surgery after she went home and took a nap and ate some food. And so I, I was waiting in the hospital for a long time, 17 hours before someone operated on me without a painkiller, just strapped down to a board, you know, MRI after MRI and CAT scan after CAT scan. And the pain was hot. It wasn't unbearable. I mean, I think nature is kind in the sense that we are not aware of everything. You know, my back felt incredibly uncomfortable. And even to this day, it feels uncomfortable a lot of the time. Uh, only if I do like back-to-back -back yoga and walk all day long do I feel okay. But as I went into surgery, there was this note that said 17% chance of death. And I remember thinking, oh yeah, but I'm 22 and I'm in great shape and I'm not going to die. That's like for weak people or that's for older people. You know, I'm that's that percentage is not for me. So I didn't really have any deep fear that I would die. It crossed my mind. I thought, well, you won't know the difference. <laughs> You're going into surgery and if it happens and there's nothing, then you just won't wake up. Well, little did I know, I popped out of body and... I, that I had heard of near-death experiences. I had taken a comparison of religion classes and I'd read, um, I've read that the moment someone has a spiritual awakening or near-death experience, their whole world changes. That that only that is is generally what changes someone's worldview, some kind of mystical experience or near-death experience. And I remember reading that line in a book, in a textbook, and going, hmm. I wonder if I'll ever change. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if I'll ever have that. And I knew in that moment when I popped out of body, I was like, yep, never going to be the same. <laughs> you know, like, we definitely go on. That's my body. And I saw it and I was excited that we go on though. I mean, it was thrilling. It, it just gave me such joy because being agnostic actually made me sad. It made me feel uh crummy about the world. I know that's kind of a silly term, but it just made me feel like, what is all this? Uh, why are we here? You know, it didn't make a lot of sense. It depressed me. And this didn't depress me. I was like, wow, there's so much that I don't understand. At 21, 22, I thought I was so wise and I knew so much about the world. 
And in that moment, I, I was like, I know nothing. <laughs> you know, like I'm looking at my body and I see that it's very bloody. And I remember first just going, hmm, surgery is a little more brutal than I thought it would be. And my hip was opened up, my back was opened up. And I remember thinking, should I be losing that much blood? But then the next thing that I saw were these large light beings behind the neurosurgeons. And they, I didn't really even think of them as angel or light. And they just sent this healing light into my soul. And I knew that, you know, not to be afraid that everything was going to be fine. And they, they sent this light through the surgeon's hands, back hands and into my body. And it lit up my entire spine. And they showed me that I would indeed have these bone fragments picked off my spine and I would walk again and run again. And they showed me uh, kind of the future, but just, you know, in this quick glimpse, you know, my future. And then the monitor stopped. And I remember thinking there's so much they want to tell me in this moment. One, they want to show me that they work through these surgeons. I wonder if the surgeons know that these angels work through them. They didn't. <laughs> and uh, I wonder, you know, if they'll work through me someday. I wonder what, what all this means. Well, the next thing, when you're spirit form, you can just move through walls. And I, I knew that, I think just from different movies, like even like Ghost and, you know, kind of silly movies that I'd seen, I just knew you could move through the walls. So I moved through the walls, saw my stepdad get a candy bar. And he's a funny, quirky guy. And I remember thinking, oh, I hope he's good to my mom. And oh, that's funny. He must have a sugar habit. He was like, kind of shamed people about their eating habits sometimes and, you know, bragged about his own good eating habits. And so I was like, ha ha, <laughs> you know, he's eating a candy bar <laughs> and he's just naturally skinny, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and it, it kind of made me chuckle in some way. And that's all that I made of that moment. I never would have guessed many, many years later, almost a decade later, IANS researchers loved that detail because that's a verifiable detail outside of form. But to me, it was just, oh, there's my stepdad, you know, no big deal. And what I didn't know and what happened later was my mom did verify that moment. And she and my dad were praying at that moment and they were on their knees because they felt I had died. And to me, that was more poignant because I was like, oh, biological parents do indeed feel uh, on a psychic level what's happening to their child. And that was touching to me. It seemed just like a part of nature and a part of the spirit world. It was, it was beautiful. But as I saw him, I transitioned outside of the hospital. I went into the night sky and I felt no fear flying around in the stars. And I just felt this oneness with everyone in my town. Anyone who had given me, you know, a cup of coffee, everyone, I just felt like, oh, we're all one. And it was this beautiful feeling of love for every single person I'd ever crossed paths with. That, you know, like if you think of a tree just telling us every day, I love you. You know, if you walk past a tree, that's that's what I felt is that kind of energy of I love you. Um, goodbye. <laughs> you know, at that point, I just, I just felt like maybe I'm not coming back, even though the angels said I am, you know, this is fun flying around. Do I really want to go back to that hospital? Do I really want to go back? So those thoughts begin. And as soon as those thoughts begin, a higher intelligence started coming towards me, but it wasn't like the full intelligence of source or God or creator or whatever you want to call it. It was just like pieces of it, almost like wisps of clouds that were moving towards me gave me certain messages like love is all that matters, all that we take with us is love when we leave, be like a little child, um, remind them to go to nature for healing, just certain really simple messages. And I remember thinking, this isn't enough. Like, I'm going to bring this back. You know, like I need more. <laughs> like uh, th These messages are very simple. And in that moment, though, I was shown my life and what I had done, and I was young, so I hadn't really harmed anyone greatly at 22, but I was judgmental and cliquish, and so what I saw is that I had been judged a lot as a kid, but in turn, I had turned around and judged people who were religious. I judged people who 
weren't in college like me. I judge people who are older than me. And why are they talking to me? I'm young. And I'm like, you know, like I judge people for all kind of ridiculous reasons. And it, um, I, I saw this one couple that was so lovely and they actually took time to pray for me. They worked at one of the restaurants I worked at and they thought I was depressed and sad and they wanted the best for me. And I didn't even befriend them because I thought they didn't have cool clothes and they weren't university students. And I thought, oh, that's embarrassing. That That's really embarrassing. And I just felt shame uh, of, of how I had thought and how I had believed, even though creator, God or source was kind of like, oh, you're just a kid, you know, like this is this isn't your highest self, but this is how you were behaving. And, and here's here's their hearts. And now I'll look into the hearts of people. And so I really can say that my whole life changed from each of these moments. And in that moment, I really have a heart for people. Like I really love people because of that moment. You know, I can't help it. Even, you know, it, it changed my heart, I think, that moment. And then as I went further, everything transitioned into this beautiful landscape where nothing died. And so some people call that heaven, but the blades of grass were beautiful. The wind was flowing through the, the grass and I was it was like a spiritual wind though. It, it was hard to describe. It was just perfect. The sky was my favorite sky, which is almost cloudless, a few clouds, but this deep blue, the sun was brightly shining and I felt completely at peace. And my grandfather was there. Um, my grandfather loved me very much on my dad's side and he died when I was 10. And actually he helped me with faith because at 10, I didn't believe in God already. I was already starting to question it. And my mom said, well, then you go pray to God and you tell him what you want and, um, you know, see if it happens. Well, I prayed to God and I should have asked for more, but I asked for a hundred dollars and that was my, my wish. And I was nine about to turn 10. My grandfather was diagnosed with leukemia. I didn't tell anyone my wish on my 10th birthday. He gave me a card full of 10, $10 bills. And so he gave me a hundred dollars and he asked me to stay a moment longer. Like we went to visit him and I was the last person to see him alive. And he kind of came up out of the bed, waved at me. And he's like, I'll always love you, Tricia. And then he, he died when we were at lunch. And, and I remember thinking, oh, he's attached to me. Well, there he was beautiful and young and his eyes were vibrant. And, you know, I recognized that jaw, the square jaw of his, and he looked so much younger. I could hardly recognize him, but his energy was the same, you know, that same loving energy. And a lot of people question this about my near-death experience, but now as a medium, I know people do all kinds of things in heaven. And so what he, because it's just consciousness. And so he showed me this car, this truck, actually, it's a 1960s Chevy truck, um, I think, or Ford truck. I'm not sure exactly which one, but I'd love to have a truck like this remade, maybe electric. It's just, it was perfect though. It had rusted in our yard and it, my dad didn't do anything with it. And it was just junk. And there in heaven, it was running perfectly. And it was the truck he used to drive me in through these fields of grass. And we did that exact same thing in heaven. And then I became like a little child. I became what God had said to be like, be like a little child. And he carried me through this grass. And I just remember thinking I could do this forever. Like, this is so much fun. Uh, why would I want to leave this place just there? But my grandfather turned and, and communicated with his eyes. Do you want to keep going? And it was almost like he was somber in that moment. And I've never communicated this in, in an interview before, but it was almost like he was a little worried. He's like, "Uh oh, she might not make it. You know, maybe she needs to go ahead and go to God. And so I was like, okay, I'm going. <laughs> and so I, I went towards God and I was excited to meet God. I mean, who wouldn't be? And as I was flowing towards this light, I could feel the prayers of my mom, my dad, my aunt Gloria, who had lost a daughter and she had died in a car wreck. And I felt her prayer, especially. And she was saying, God, don't do this to her family. You know, let her live. This is, this is too much. The pain's too great. And so I felt the sincerity of her prayer. I felt my grandmother's prayer. 
but it's almost like their prayers were trying to pull me back to my body. And so I broke through the prayers and was like, no, no, I know you love me. <laughs> you know? And at that point, I thought, oh, they don't understand. I was already beginning to get this sense of timelessness that even if I did stay there, it would seem like a day or two to me before they died. It really wouldn't seem that long because time just doesn't have the same meaning. Well, as I got closer to God, though, I definitely didn't want to come back. So there were points along the way when I didn't want to come back. But as I felt all the wounds of childhood leaving, as I felt, you know, all that had been done to me was not mine to carry anymore. And it was left behind. And my innocence was returning. You know, there was this absolute joy just in being me. And I felt for the first time, completely loved and completely safe and completely free. So, you know, love and freedom are often hard to find here. You know, you can find love with possession, you can find freedom without love, you know, but, but that's what I found in the presence of God was complete love and complete freedom. You know, that there was no control, there was no judgment, it was just pure love. Who would want to leave that space? And that. That's when I had that thought, I'm not going back. I felt like I hit an energetic wall. There was not an actual wall, but it was just like, I couldn't keep going towards God. And I would say I was in the light of God, but not all the way. And a lot of near-death experiencers have that barrier somewhere, you know, in their experience. It just happens. And then I felt this booming vibration and God said, look down. I saw all these lights walking along a river, but some of the lights had shadows over them. And God said, you're going to be a teacher and you're going to remind people to be in the light of their soul, to connect with, to God. And literally I was like, no, 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 I'm a feminist. No, no, no. I uh, want to be rich. There's no way I'm going to go back to that earth down there and be a teacher. No, no, no. And then God kind of laughed at me. Like, you don't even understand yourself. Like, I know you better than you know you. And it was kind of a funny moment, but also a painful moment because that was my last moment with God. And I was curled back into my body. I say like a softball, like I was thrown into my body and it was painful. Like I felt the dark layers of, of everything coming towards me. And yeah. I, I knew I had a near-death experience from the first moment I woke up out of surgery. Incredible. Thank you so, so much for sharing that with me. Um, I have so many questions for you. <laughs> <laughs> what an incredible experience and what an eye-opener. It's amazing like what we can learn from these near-death experiences. Um, I wondered about that. Like you, I think you had mentioned at one point, maybe not specifically about anything, but you did mention a higher self, which kind of inspired a question for me. What, what do you feel about the concept of higher self? Do you think that we all have a higher self who's up there or over there on the other side of the veil, who's kind of like with our guardian angels and our guides kind of just looking over everything? Or is it just sort of more a metaphorical concept that people are bouncing around? And, you know, it, this, the experience of these metaphysical concepts is always a little different from the words that we use to describe it. And so it's challenging. But what I feel is, you know, how is it that the worst possible things can be done to people here on earth, but heaven is able to heal these things? I mean, you know, the absolute worst atrocities. I think a part of our soul will always be protected by our higher self will always be held there. So if you know you want to call it higher self or you want to just call it the whole soul has an understanding of heaven and has an understanding that you know we came here, you know, for a particular reason. So I think a part of us is held somewhere else so that we can't completely be destroyed by this physical experience. You know, that there's always a higher self that's that sees the whole trajectory that lives outside of time that whispers to us like hey this is your calling you know that that knows where you're going yeah i think that's a good explanation i, I feel the same way i feel i feel as though also maybe um just a portion of our our consciousness um incarnates in various places maybe simultaneously maybe not 
but I, I like I just feel like a piece of it's here and 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 I feel like the rest of it's elsewhere you know I don't feel like our entire soul kind of the way that you described incarnates with us you know it's still intact but in a way separate you know yeah yeah, yeah. there's a because there was an instant kind of knowing it was almost like some of the knowledge that was given to me was knowledge I already knew but I'd forgotten as I crossed the veil you know it, it's it's fascinating yeah did you actually um have any conversations with the doctors after yes. your NDE yeah. yes and so you know recently I you know people challenge these experiences all the time and I got this horrible a review and this guy was like she didn't even you know tell her doctor about the verifiable details well I didn't even think about that when I woke up uh I was you know on morphine I'd just come out of anesthesia but I find it fascinating that I remembered everything and I wanted to talk about it so as soon as I saw well as soon as the nurse gave me ice chips they were saying who what is your name and I said her name is Trisha and I really didn't identify fully with myself. I just felt like I was in the room and I was also over there. And how could I be totally in this body? And that was such a foreign concept to someone who was so encased in her body before. I mean, you know, when you think about experimenting with drugs, it was like, what is this drug going to make me feel like, you know, how can I have more coffee? How, I mean, my whole life was around the body. And then I just wasn't the body. I mean, that was so weird. You know, like I, I was so much more than this body. And I then I realized, oh, I'm my soul's gonna, you know, at least part of my soul, you know, this consciousness is gonna have to live in this body. And this body still has wounds and it still has physical wounds and emotional wounds. And, you know, it, it felt constricting. Consciousness felt expansive and being in my body felt very constricting and uncomfortable and I didn't want to be there and then the surgeon came in and she said oh you know it was successful we're so happy and I was like how long did I die you know how long was I dead and that was my first question to her and she stepped back and before surgery we had talked about her BMW and her practice and you know like I had been charming you know in, in certain ways and 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 kind of thought she was cool she looked a little like my age now or a little younger and you know she was this brilliant surgeon who was happy about what she was doing and I just thought wonderful uh you know th that she's going to be my surgeon but she had no interest in this in fact she often like shot me these glances like shut up you know like there was a real and I could read her in in ways that I couldn't read her before and that was part of the after effects and and she was like I don't want to have to prescribe you medicine or send you, you know, to a psych ward after this, like, she was like, uh, uh, you know, we're not talking about this. We're talking about how successful it is, how you're going to walk, how you're going to run. And so all she said, literally was, we thought we lost you for a couple of minutes, but you're getting blood transfusions. You'll be fine. And, you know, in, in other words, move on you know, from talking about this subject. So I moved on. Hence but not the downplay. I think that she, she wanted you to move on, eh? Yeah. Yes. And I didn't move on with other people, though. So the nurses, my family, I talked about it until people were, were literally making fun of me. My family was like how could she go to heaven? <laughs> like they're all <laughs> judgy, you know, different, different religious aunts. And, uh, and then my grandmother was one person who was open because my experience aligns with Catholicism in some ways, you know, this idea of angels. And so she was fascinated in the angels and she bought me a journal. And when I got out of the ICU, I wrote about the angels and, and nurses would kind of, you know, listen to me, but they were like, mm -hmm, yeah, I believe in God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it was just that, that kind of, mm -hmm. and no one really understood uh, fully until my neighbor came to visit me and she was spiritual. And she said, I believe you. And that was that. And so I knew I had this spiritual friend and, and her and her roommate who practiced Reiki, um, they just became the dearest friends because they happened to live next to me and be spiritual. And it, it's so weird how I'll always love my friends from college, you know, but we have a variety of beliefs and some of them are still agnostic. And and those, she was brought into my life for a particular reason. Mm -hmm. 
amazing like right next door that's just insanity i love it (laughs) i know (laughs) that's wonderful and when you were like um out of your body and flying amongst the stars and wow that must have felt amazing um did you feel or have the sense that you were alone or did you sense any other beings or energy at the time it's interesting that you asked that i didn't feel fear because i didn't feel alone so the angels, I think, were still with my body, but I was beginning to feel pieces of consciousness, but it was just light. So maybe it was from God. Maybe these were entities that were just kind of encased in light. But whatever I, the the reality is, I just didn't feel alone. I felt like I was talking to a consciousness out there. And maybe it was just the consciousness of the stars, you know, like everything's alive. So well, isn't everything just the consciousness of the stars? I mean, that's what we're made of, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, (laughs) you know, it was, it was beautiful though. I just didn't feel afraid. It was, you know, the closest thing that I think people can experience is probably when they try hallucinogens here. Um, And I had tried them before my near death experience, but I didn't have quite the, you know, the visuals and and it, 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 felt like you can get glimpses with hallucinogens but this was the full how many times did you do them and what did you do i said a few times and i also um, took mushrooms and the mushrooms were the closest thing i think to the love the harmony that i felt so that that complete sense of oh this is beautiful oh the visuals are so beautiful i'm alive feeling stars yeah Yeah, that was kind of comparable to but you know but i did mushrooms not in the right setting you know the one place where i had a good experience was at a aldor festival which wasn't really a lot of music but it had people drumming and walking around and selling jewelry and so i just laid on a blanket and felt the energy of the trees well uh, you know after my near-death experience i was stuck there i mean it was almost like my brain was on mushrooms constantly <laughs> you know, like yeah. at least a medium dose low dose you know because i just began to see the energy of people animals trees you know i i saw that nature sends us healing codes you know that nature really sends us light and love the yeah. actual trees do and that was a visual reality for me and the celestine prophecy was a big you know like hit at that time when right after i'd had my near-death experience so it kind of helped me put into words what i was experiencing do you do walking meditations like yeah, when walk- sometimes. yeah. Because I noticed like um, after maybe, I don't know, second awakening that when I was going out a lot more often for walks, it would slowly, gradually turn into these meditational walks, if that's even a word. But yeah. it was something that you had, you had mentioned just sparked up this memory because, well, memory, it happens still. But you feel that energy of the trees, the mailboxes, I mean, the, the, the pavement, you feel everything. Communication, I mean, I've you know, without sounding too woo woo here for for some folks, but most of the communicational kind of aspects of it for me during these meditations is is the tree, the communication with the trees. And it's not like you're sitting there having or walking by and, you know, suddenly having a conversation out loud with a tree. It's not like that, obviously, as you know, but I would probably tend to stand for a little bit, you know, without, you know, stop walking and stand there in front of a a particular tree. And then you do, you, you feel these messages of love and and appreciation and then suddenly that turns into like res- deep respect and admiration like that's yeah. hard to even measure you know because you realize how much more powerful those beings are than yourself you know Does that make ancient sense? you know like they have their own spirits is what i've felt at times that they have yeah. these ancient spirits that have reincarnated into different trees and it was yeah mm. it's beautiful it is it's really amazing and and there's one time like I think, you know, these experiences that people, including myself, I've experienced a few times, acid, mushrooms, these experiences are, can be really amazing. And I think certain aspects from some of these, I and mean, sometimes you can have a bad trip, but when you have the good ones and the kind of spiritual ones, aspects of those can be very similar to maybe your actual NDE, you know, or even mine, but yeah. not the whole thing, but there are aspects of it. But then you know, I think once you make that connection, that that real that that connection to uh, the source or whatever you want to call it, this connection to God, connection to your spirituality, 
to your guides, to your guardian angels, whatever it is, you don't need that anymore. You don't need those hallucinogenics because you get the same experiences. You know? Yeah, that yeah. when you're open <laughs> and mm. aligned, and I felt like you know all my chakras had been blown out from the near-death experience. I didn't. I didn't really actually know how I died until I did my first television interview um, because they went back to the doctors and they looked at at what happened and I bled to death. Like my energy was so strong after the near death experience. Like I I think all my chakras had just been, you know, cleaned out. When you were there um on the other side, did you experience that as well where you saw the timeline simultaneously or you realized that well, uh, you know, the thing that's interesting, some near-death experiencers, you know, see the future. I saw this river and I thought the river was metaphorical until I got a job at Trinity River Campus. And it's this beautiful building where it overlooks the Trinity River here in Fort Worth. And certain classrooms are the exact replica of what I saw from that heavenly realm. And so I'm often teaching meditation to students in English 1301. I've even taken them on walks along the river, meditative walks, and, and just ask them to be quiet and leave their phones in the classroom and really see if they feel better, if their anxiety level decreases doing something like that. And they always report, you know, even the ones who are highly agitated and highly addicted to technology will at least say, well, I feel a couple of numbers less <laughs> anxious, you know, but, but most people feel a significant amount of uh, anxiety decreasing. And anxiety is one of the main problems, I think, with this generation. I think it's connected to giving too much of their energy to the machine. Like our own intuition can help us in certain ways. You know, standing next to a tree can give you healing, can give you insight. And you're not always going to find the answer that you need in your phone. <laughs> you know, like Sometimes you will, but sometimes you have to listen to yourself. Um, and go against like intuition sometimes doesn't make a bit of sense, you know, until you follow the path and then it unfolds. And that's a very that's, good point. Yeah. That's the way teaching was. I thought it sounded awful, but oh my God, I've enjoyed every moment of it. Like I'm a natural and I love students and I care for them and all of that that they are working through are things I needed to work through. And I was just a little further along the way to help them. And so it became this. I understood at different points that even though this physical body still deals with some amount of depression, my depression is alleviated the minute I'm in the classroom, the minute I stood, no matter what was happening in my outside life, it was a holy place for me because I believed that angels would support me, that God had given me this mission. And I saw each of my students as a soul worthy of of me seeing the highest and best good for them. And, and even if they are agnostic or atheist, you know, going in the direction of a dream, you know, if you're a scientist and you're excited about your invention, you are in the light of God, like, because you're in the light of what you love doing. And so it's really simple to inspire people to do what they love, you know, and to follow their dreams. Yeah. Well said, well said. That's amazing. Do you think that we generally can or do construct our own, versions of heaven when we pass? I think we can. We want to be comforted by things that gave our souls comfort here. And so I've heard different mediums talk about how someone will play golf, you know, in heaven, and, and yet they get a hole in one every time, you know, like, you know, because whatever you're imagining, but it's just the act of playing it. Um, you know, it, it seemed so peaceful and that remembering of earth was comforting because as your soul is detaching you know it, for some people it might be kind of weird to just be in the stars or to you know go into the light that i think it, it's a necessary it's when we just talk about it like it's nothing sometimes right <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> i know well because i can still do it in meditation sometimes exactly <laughs> not always you know sometimes this earth has me pretty locked down <laughs> It was a message of nothing ever really dies, too. At a spiritual level, it continues. So even though death occurs here, it doesn't occur there. And that gave me greater peace, that there's there's some part of everything, even a blade of grass, that doesn't die. 
Yeah. And I love the fact that you brought up uh, that aspect of your uh, NDE, um, hearing the prayers of your family members. I mean, that's a, that's that's something. That's crazy. Not crazy. It's, it's beautiful. But, you know, the fact that you could hear them, and then I'm, I understand why you shut them off, but <laughs> I probably would too, you know, but... <laughs> But I still think that's amazing. And I, and I was curious, like, did you ever get any kind of like validation on that um, aspect of your experience? Well, I think the, I asked my grandmother and my mom and my dad, and um, my grandmother said she was definitely praying. And she was the first one at the hospital, even though she was the farthest away. The minute she heard the call, she got right in her car and and drove to see me. And my mom was at work and had to finish and, you know, then there were different people, but my mom and dad were praying at that moment because, you know, my near death experience was only two and a half minutes. And if I saw my stepdad get the candy bar, come back in and my mom and dad were on their knees praying, then probably, you know, that's when I was dying. You know, like that's, yeah. I saw him by the time he got back to give them the candy bar, you know, minutes had passed. And, and so hearing those prayers, I always like to remind people, look, even if someone dies, they still feel your love. I mean, prayer is just, ultimately, it should be just sending love. It's just sending, hey, I don't want you to go, or hey, I love you. Um, I'm connected to you. You know, that's, Also a wonderful that, way to, if you hadn't had the opportunity to say goodbye to a certain person, yes. prayer does work, as you say. I mean, they will hear that. So it's, I mean, it's better than a cell phone, obviously. It's yeah, <laughs> it is. It is. Yeah. What I do say to near death experiencers is get out there and take courses because you'll find you're you're a whiz at it now. You know, like this is this is easy for you. You know, yeah. you can learn how to be a medium. You can learn how to hear more, experience more. Yeah. When you were in heaven, did you notice like did you ever have that feeling of all knowing, like um, like you were provided downloads? Um, it doesn't mean necessarily that you just knew everything all of a sudden, but if there's something you wanted to know, it was like right there at your grasp. Did you experience that? I feel like if I would have stayed there longer, anything I wanted to know would have been answered by God. And um, yet I, I wasn't allowed to stay there for very long. Um, and that's, yeah, if I could go back, I mean, I've interviewed Howard Storm and I've interviewed people who just sat there and conversed with God for some time. And I was like, darn, why didn't I have more questions? <laughs> but um, I think it was just so fast. You know, as I mentioned to you before, one of the sole purposes, I, I think, for my channel is to help people with uh, getting over their fear of death. Is there any sort of like last message from Trisha Barker on this subject that we can put across before we leave? Yeah, you know, it's been so... It's been such an honor and it's been such joy to talk to people on the other side. And just recently, there was a woman who lost her fiance quite young and he was young and he had a sudden brain tumor. And, you know, there was this choice he had to make to go and he didn't understand it fully, but he decided to be brave. And I think we're all brave in coming here and we're all brave in leaving. And I think honoring yourself and loving yourself for choosing this journey and choosing to be here at this time is a really beautiful thing. And hopefully that takes some of the sting out of the dying process because the people who I have seen die well, and my father was one of them, you know, he's, he was a Vietnam vet. He saw a lot of death. And so I think he had come to terms with dying a long time ago. And when he did it, he died with the glee and joy and bravery. And it, um, it's such an honor to see some people die that way. And you have kids, and, you know, I, I have this feeling that when your time is there, you'll die in a brave way for them too, because it helps them not fear death. You know, when you see someone still connected to their soul, even though their body is going, it's, it's really quite an amazing thing. You know, it, it really, it is. And so I hope that this inspires bravery in people, both bravery to live the life that you want and bravery to die with, with love, you know, with joy for the, with gratitude for this life experience and excitement for what comes next. 
<laughs> so the book, your book is um, Angels in the OR. I hope you guys go ahead and, and download it or purchase it. We'll leave a link in the description box how you can get a hold of that. Thank you so very much, Trisha. It's been such a blessing and I uh, really appreciate your, your, um, your sharing everything and your insight. It's, it's been really wonderful. Thank you so much. It has been fun. Have a great day. You too. Blessings.